sorry. May I borrow a cup of your sugar? What? I never gave much thought until I put up a fresh pot of coffee. And I was on my way to the store, and I thought, Nick, you'd have sugar. Tell me your story. I leave. Sugarless. You come back in, you put your penis on exhibition, and although my coffee's probably gone bad by now, I insist on following through. It's like something from a Norman Rockwell painting. What, my penis? No. <laughs> no, the sugar. Neighbors borrowing sugar from one another. Lucky Number Slevin is a 2006 crime thriller film directed by Paul McGugan. Starring Josh Hartnett, Morgan Freeman, Ben Kingsley, Lucy Liu, Bruce Willis, and so many more. Let's take a quick look. He's in our men town. Because of a Kansas City chef. He knows a lot of people. People connected only by the slightest of events. Give me your wallet. Am I being mugged? That is how these affairs begin. The cat's in town. Good cat? Who's good cat? He shows people dying. He vanishes. Who are you looking for? This is our guy, Nick Fisher. Who is he? The kid and I have unfinished business. <laughs> Boss wants to see you. <laughs> Who's the boss? The guy we work for. I'm not the guy you're looking for. I don't live here. Yeah, well, you look like the guy that lives here. Then you don't know what the guy that lives here looks like. What he means to say is you look like you live here. Yeah, that's what I mean to say. <gasps> what happened to your nose? It's a very long story. <laughs> I think it's time you told me that story. Well, there's this guy and they call him the boss. I'm sorry, who are you? I'm the boss. They picked up the wrong guy. Wrong guy for what? Whatever it is you want to see me about. Do you know what I want to see you about? No. Then how do you know I have the wrong guy? Then right across the street lives this other crime boss they call the rabbi. Why they call him the rabbi? Because he's a rabbi. Yeah. But I'm not Nick Fisher. And who the hell are you? I'm Slevin. That's not Nick Fisher. I know. He set you up. <laughs> you should run. I can't. They'll kill you if you stay. They'll kill me if I leave. Time's up. I'm a world-class assassin. I'm gonna kill somebody. I'm thinking of a new option. Lucky number 11. Welcome back to the Cult of Films. John here, so glad to be back with you. We are talking about a crime thriller this time, 2006, Lucky Number 11. I am not doing this alone. I have a very special guest tonight, and for anyone that is watching or has watched this channel since the beginning almost, since 2016, you will remember this face, as you should, because the just without further ado, one of my best friends in the entire world since freshman year of high school, Mr. Dead Guy Ty, a.k.a. Tyler Perez himself. Thank you so much for coming back on the show, sir. What's up, dude? Thanks for having me, man. I'm glad to be here. You and I used to do a little show uh, for the Walking Dead community called Dead Guys Talking. It was a ton of fun. We got to do some trivia stuff. All that cool jazz, but uh, since life got in the way and The Walking Dead started sucking, so <laughs> we don't uh, get to get together as, as much as I wish we could still, but we found a movie that you and I could talk about tonight, and I mean, what a doozy, because, uh, you know, I watch a lot of movies, and if memory serves, you actually showed me this film. Yeah. Yeah, I and it was a movie that we didn't even learn about until after it came out, you know, uh, on DVD. That's uh, how old it is. Oh. Yeah, I heard about it from a coworker and I watched it and I was just like, dude, John, you've got to watch this movie. And uh, I don't think it let I don't think it uh, let you down. No, uh, I, I I like this this type of film. A lot of people. Uh, kind of compared it i think unfairly to a lot of the early tarantino films which i don't think it is correct i feel like you know everyone's like oh it's kind of like a pulp fiction or it's kind of like uh reservoir dogs and i don't think that's true because i i think if anything if you want to make a, a comparison as far as uh paul mcgugan's uh as a filmmaker as far as this film goes i think more of like maybe lock stocks two smoking barrels or snatch like early good guy Richie would be more apt of a comparison. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, I think I know where people are coming from 
comparing it to Tarantino just because it has the twist at the end. You know, Tarantino usually has some sort of a, a plot twist or, you know, some kind of a reveal. But Tarantino does a lot of back and forth mm-hmm. in the storyline. And I guess there's a little bit of that here, but I don't think quite enough to call it Tarantino style. Yeah, it, it's yeah, it's shot like the continuity is uh, a, a little bit messy, but not as you know, back and forth as like a Pulp Fiction. Uh, I have a special guest that I can consume, <laughs> and so do you. So, uh, who do you have, or what do you have joining you tonight, sir? Relation to uh, what's going on in the world right now, I am drinking Batshit Crazy. Oh, let's see if we can get turned right here. Yep, uh, Batshit Crazy by Mobcraft Brewing. That is a coffee brown ale. Excuse me, that sounds delicious. Uh, I just felt so goddamn uh, nostalgic having you back on the channel so i went to our old walking dead roots and i have a lucille from georgetown brewery this is a a seven percent india pale ale from seattle washington uh and i poured it in our our walking dead stein because rick and stuff when it was good so cheers sir cheers perfect all right so let's start off uh by talking about so this is directed by Paul McGugan, who is a Scottish filmmaker. Um, I, the other films that he directed was Wicker Park, Push, and Victor Frankenstein. I can't say that I'm familiar with his style as a whole because I've never seen his other films, so I don't know how close or in line that Lucky Number Slevin is to the, the rest of his films, if it's kind of like the same uh, type style that he shoots in. I've heard Victor Frankenstein was actually better than uh, it was probably supposed to be. So um, I know he didn't write this, but he shows, uh, you know, this is one of his early films and he showed like he definitely had chops making this this movie. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've never even thought to look into his other movies. But so, yeah, I don't know whether they're the same style or not. But I mean, yeah, I mean, he he hit out of the park with this one. Wicker Park, I, I guess he was on a Josh Hartnett uh, kick, but who wasn't back in the you know late '90s, early 2000s, uh, for better or worse, right? Uh, but this thing had a 27 million dollar budget. Box office made 56 uh, worldwide. So you know you got to think with um, marketing and you know advertisement and everything. You're basically breaking even with that. So it wasn't a financial failure. At least it it made its money back. But you you said uh, you remember that. It was it wasn't critically uh, uh, well liked back then, right? Yeah, uh, from what I remember, is it got horrible reviews in the box office, and which makes me like the movie even that much more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you look at the tomato meter; I think it's at like a fifty-one percent, so it, it's literally split down the middle. But again, you think about when this came out and what was out around that time you know that's probably why people compared it to a tarantino film just because there wasn't a lot of films like this that came out back then and you know i think this was even before like a departed or something which again you shouldn't compare this to the departed it's a totally different kind of film but the big difference to this film even though it's a crime thriller is this movie is so goddamn fun oh yeah absolutely starts out slow but even then it's just it's just so fun it's bruce willis in a wheelchair in an old just like almost empty bus stop he's got like a almost a like a you know i don't know mafia type apparel you know he's got the sweater vest and the you know the sports coat what was the first line of the movie i think uh there was a time yeah you know and it's just yeah it's just it's it's super fun at the same time as it's even in its serious moments it's still just fun and funny and it did something at the very beginning that really hooked me and that is it does the for whatever reason i'm a sucker for good credit scenes like i like you put a good mm-hmm. credit montage in your film i'm like on board uh and this one has just that like like i think the opening i think you think of good like uh opening sequence like to seven to the movie you know david fincher seven and it like it hooks you right away because it's like terrifying and it has all these things going on this literally tells a, a story and sets up everything without a word of dialogue you get introduced to um well, you don't really get introduced to you just, you know, you know, 
that there is a mysterious hitman that's going around knocking off people, and you don't know who these people are, you don't know who this hitman is, you don't know the reasons behind it, but you sure do want to know. Yeah, and I don't know if you noticed at all, but also the opening credits are almost, it's like a ledger, too. Yeah. You get everybody's name, and then there's, like, you know, amounts written at the same time, so it it's kind of a, a hidden thing that you may not notice the first time that you watch the movie. Yeah, it's 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 like a ledger, like a like a bookie's ledger, and more on that later. Uh, see, he he knew what he was doing, Mister McGugan. It just sounds like if I don't know, I don't want to be mean. You know, it's the guy's last name, but it's like Mister McGugan. You did good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just talking about the cast, like this was the who's who of the early two thousands, or you know, even late. Uh, uh, 1990s, you had Josh Hartnett, who was just in everything back then, uh, Morgan Freeman, Ben Kingsley, who are like Academy Award winning uh, actors, and then you also had Lucy Liu, who was in a ton of stuff, and, you know, Bruce Willis, who, I, you know, I haven't always been a huge fan of, but in the right role, Bruce Willis uh, could do good work, and he puts in great work in this film. <laughs> Oh, yeah, man. Bruce Willis is awesome, though. Come on. I mean, die hard. I mean, it's you know, the guy's the guy's a legend, you know, especially especially 90s. Paul McGugan just like gave these crazy characters almost like Snatch, uh, like we said, you know, comparing this to a, a Snatch or whatever, um, like Morgan Freeman and Ben Kingsley just get to play these like cool character roles like ben kingsley is his he's eating up every scene he's in because you know he's not he doesn't have to be gandhi in this he just gets to be this crazy you know half mobster half rabbi oh yeah i mean and some of his lines are just <laughs> awesome um but when he talks about luck you are unlucky so that i may know that i am not unfortunately the lucky never realized they are lucky until it's too late Take yourself, for instance. Yesterday you were better off than you are today, but it took today for you to realize it. But today has arrived, and it's too late. You see? <laughs> He's doing this crazy accent, and then, you know, and Morgan Freeman even, you know, because I think around that time, Morgan Freeman's, uh, you know, he's always the the kind grandfather role, you know, he's always trying to be an, a nice guy to show the right way, and then, but, like, he's just a complete dickhead in this film, and it's fun to, to see kind of, like, the, the evil side of Morgan Freeman, too. He's played, like, God on a couple movies, you know? I mean, <laughs> you know, definitely a, a much different role for him. But, I mean, uh, dude, he, he he freaking nailed it, man. Yeah. And, I mean, in all fairness to Josh Hartnett, he was just Josh Hartnett being Josh Hartnett. But that's what he did. And I think that worked in this role. You see an evolution of his character sure. in almost a split second. You know, because you see who, who he was, you know, who he was supposed to be and then at the end you see this twist and he just kind of puts on a whole different mask and becomes a completely different person I, like like you know I, I kind of sold him short where he's just kind of you know playing the the kind of you know 90s hot guy and then he kind of evolves into this more menacing uh character with reason you know menacing with a heart i guess but but you know uh and we're just, I just want to say, you know, from here on out, spoilers, this movie came out in 2006. This isn't like, uh, you know, uh, The Lighthouse or Parasite, something that you might not have been able to see, especially with, you know, everyone getting corona out there. You know, no one is able to make it to the theaters. This came out in 2006. If you haven't gotten the divid like Tyler and I did, we put in the work to get it. So we expect the audience right. to, too. So spoilers throughout. We're going to... We're really gonna, you know, want to talk about this film. So Deadly serious. let's talk about some, some of uh, another character uh, that put in good work. A another person that was like red hot back in this era, and that's Lucy Liu. And honestly, I was never really a huge Lucy Liu fan, mm -hmm. but in this movie, she was awesome. She, you know, she was cute. She was funny. She was spunky. She was everything this this role called for. I, I think that you nailed it there because, you know, usually Lucy Liu, especially around that time, was either like a badass, uh, you know, assassin girl Angel, or something. Charlie's like Angel. <laughs> yeah, but, but they allowed her to be kind of just like laid back and kind of girlfriendy. I, you know, if that's a verb or uh, adjective, <laughs> it's kind of a... A weird way to describe it. Her. It is now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so yeah, it was it was a different role for her, especially at the time, and it allowed 
uh, for their chemistry to really shine. I mean, not a lot of people could have, you know, when Josh Hartnett's just smoldering all the time, she, she was she was good at uh, finding the chemistry between those two. Like the the, I, I don't know. I, I think that I, I really sold them caring about each other in this film. Yeah, absolutely. In, in both ways, like you said, yeah, they they really they sold it. You know, everybody who that I've talked to that watched the movie. I mean, obviously not the critics, but everyone that I personally know that have watched the movie, they they completely agree. Yeah, and just in a, in a like a nutshell, just kind of like a, a cliff notes. What is this film about, Tyler? I mean, I would say it's uh, I don't know. I, I want to call it an organized crime movie, mm-hmm. but it's it's got the the comedic value to it that it has i mean it's got it's got a love story to it so i mean i guess it would just say it's it's an organized crime flick with a plot twist at the end that really just makes the whole movie worth it yeah sure uh it's genre bending which i think is one of its strengths it's a crime film but it's also a comedy definitely a, a dark comedy because when they they don't shy away from the brutality in this, but it never takes itself seriously, even when it gets like super brutal. Yeah, definitely. Even when, you know, somebody's taking a bullet to the head. I mean, there's still, yeah, there's still something kind of, I mean, dark about it because it's murder, but there's also a light kind of humor, kind of suspense to keep you, um, to keep you engaged. Yeah. Uh, even a baseball to the eye is, is funny or terrifying because it makes you kind of feel both. Um, so even a dead guy in the freezer, there's <laughs> humor to that, you know? <laughs> exactly. It's a little bit, you know, non-linear storytelling where we we do some flash forwards, some or not so much flash forwards, but we do some flashbacks and then back to you know present day where it kind of explains that, you know, it, but it, but it's it's all shrouded in mystery because the whole kind of you know deal uh, about it is uh, that Josh Hartnett's character uh, named Slevin with a last name that I can't pronounce is. It, it's kind of like a, a case of, of um, mistaken identity where he it's just like he seemingly is just this random dude that's just visiting his friend and then just gets wrapped up in all these, you know, in between this mob war in between Ben Kingsley, who plays the rabbi and uh, Morgan Freeman, who plays the boss. It, it You really do. You, you fall for the whole thing. You know, I mean, Josh Hartnett, I mean, he sells everything. He doesn't only sell his chemistry with Lucy Liu, but he sells the whole uh, you know, the clerks, I'm not even supposed to be here today, right. <laughs> um, you know, um, type, you know, mentality going and, and, and you, he sells it. He sells it perfectly. He's just constantly getting punched in the face, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another thing that I, I really uh, appreciate and, and think that this film in particularly you know, delineates from other genre films in this genre is that it takes time to have these like Paul Thomas Anderson esque, like long dialogue scenes where it's just like a lot of the times in, in, especially in in this era, um, you know, you watch like Michael Mann films and it's just like the, the pacing of it's just like, Oh, we got to get to, you know, MacGuffin to MacGuffin and all these things, you know, the action has to keep going because it's like a popcorn film. But this film, uh, like slows the fuck down sometimes and allows people just to talk in rooms. Right. Or or in a surveillance van or, you know, whatever it may be. And and one thing is also so just great is it's got so many just great lines. Yeah. You know, I mean, everywhere from what happened to your nose? I was using it to break some guy's fist to, you know, uh, the beginning line. I, I still the, the whole, you know, there was a time. And there's a point, I think it's when the actual real Nick, uh, Mr. Goodcat, tells him, you know, the story and, you know, Jesus, shit, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, shit, fuck. Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, one thing I gave credit to in the beginning was that uh, that credit scene. But then it goes into this, uh, that scene in particular, like we, like you were just uh, alluding to, where Mr. Goodcat, uh, who's played by Bruce Willis, is talking to this 
seemingly random person in the bus station who turns out to be Nick, and he's telling him, you know, this kind of a little bit of the backstory, or, or you don't even know at this point it's backstory, but just a story, and that's why he's like, oh my god, and then, uh, you know, during that, you get a lot of voiceover, which I, you know, at first when I was watching the credit scene where they're giving you all this information. I'm like, wow, this is cool. Cause they're really uh, trusting the audience. They're not holding your hand through voiceover or, or, you know, reading a letter or something like that. But then we're kind of subjected to, you know, probably like 10 minutes of voiceover. So that was at least to me a little bit uh, disappointing. It wasn't a, as much of a problem for you though. Right. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't have a huge problem with it. Um, I, I do agree. It was a little unnecessary, but I, I don't think it was enough to, to, to take away from it. At least for me, it wasn't. Yeah. And I, to be fair, uh, it was, it was done in a, you know, he's literally telling a story. So, you know, that, that kind of gives it a little bit of a pass. It, it, you know, it's like, like, uh, you know, we said it's princess bride, but imagine if, you know, Peter Falk snapped Fred Savage's neck doing a, <laughs> uh, what is it? A Louisiana shuffle? No, Kansas City Shuffle. Kansas City Shuffle. I'm like, Kentucky Shuffle? I don't know. Kentucky Fried <laughs> Chicken Shuffle? I don't know. Yeah. He's just like, I don't like kissing, Grandpa. Uh, shut up, bud. Go look left. <laughs> oh. Snaps his neck. <laughs> that's just that's just a small critique. It's not all rose-colored glasses, but at least for me. But you watching this film, uh, because we, we loved it so much back then, and then you just rewatched it now, did it hold up? to how you felt about it then and do you think it holds up just as a good movie for for you to like tell tell people about it today yeah so well you know let's just start off this watching this movie again brought a lot of nostalgia you know (laughs) I, i i had to open up a dvd and put it into a dvd player and I think I had forgot how to use that. <laughs> um, it took me a while to find the DVD menu just to play the movie. Sure. So, um, you know, it just kind of shows um, – it doesn't seem like that long ago the, that the movie came out. But I guess it just shows um, how time has progressed since that movie has come out. Yeah. And um, I think it still holds up. I think it does. Uh, the, the plot twist at the end I think is just seriously still just what makes the movie. And even though – I mean I've watched the movie several times mm. and still I there was things that I noticed in the movie that didn't give it away. But I guess that hinted towards the, the ending reveal um, that I never noticed before. And I still keep myself just so excited to see that moment. When, you know, you see the look on the boss and the rabbi's faces when shit goes down. And the whole time I still just find myself just anticipating that moment where it's just like Josh gets his, you know, or Slevin gets his, you know, big F you moment. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I I do. I do think that it holds up and I would recommend it. Uh, for people that haven't seen it even now you know there there's some stuff that doesn't hold up as far as just like cg effects they're they're not always the greatest like when they they go from like you know showing uh morgan freeman from the window and then they zoom over across the street it the the cg is dated but it's 2006 it is this had a 27 million dollar budget and they probably blew it all on a great cast so i'd rather have a great cast than cleaned up cg for this type of movie, yes, absolutely. This type of movie you could deal without. There, there was no need for any special effects or anything like that. There was action, but not like, well, since it's Bruce Willis we're talking about, not die-hard action, right. you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, the, as far as the gore goes, like this had great uh, practical effects. Oh, yeah. I mean, it didn't shy, like like you said before, it didn't shy away from the dark side of things, the, you know, sniping you know, somebody off from, from a building and, you know, showing a dead guy in a freezer and adding humor to it. I mean, it definitely didn't shy away from it, but it didn't, it didn't overdo it in my opinion either. Oh no. I'm going to put my pretentious, you know, movie critic, uh, hat on real quick. So just, you know, try not to vomit, but you know, (laughs) there is some points in the movie at the beginning, which see, you know, this, I, I believe this is either, uh, uh, Mr. McGugan's, you know, first film that he directed, or at least pretty close to it. Um, but the, you know, so as, as much as it showed, 
uh, a lot of maturity making a film like this, especially early on uh, in, in his career. Like, some of the editing is just way overdone, uh, and it's super choppy. They do this weird, like, speed-up slowdown tracking. Like, when we first get introduced to Slevin, he's, like, coming to the city, and he's telling... Uh, oh, yeah. Lucy Liu's character about you know like uh, getting mugged and stuff and it ha- and it's like he's moving at a, a real pace but like everything else is like sped up and it's just weird and I'm just like why it's a weird choice and there's a lot of like fade to black cuts and odd amateurish like lighting filters like throughout so it's like he I, I appreciate because he let a lot of those like when they're when they're just talking in rooms or doing like big reveals he kind of like shuts up the editing like he's just like okay i'm just gonna let the 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 you know the The substance be the substance but sometimes like in the filler it's like the editing's all over the place i'm like what the fuck yeah it's it's a little discombobulating yeah what i appreciated about the cinematography and everything that you're referring to when he's talking when it when it's it's showing his story that he's telling lucy Liu. what i appreciated from it is it gave a kind of almost like a made up choppy feel to the to the story and that's what it was sure. and so to me it kind of i kind of got that that's kind of at least the, the second and you know third and plus times watching it is i think it fits that it's this just made up choppy story that doesn't quite make sense so i think the movements and stuff like that kind of add that uh, uh, that's a great point. I mean, it, it just from like a um, audience member, it, for, like looking at it, it looks ugly. But I mean, you're right. Maybe that was a stylistic choice to kind of convey to the audience that it was just, it was bullshit and it, <laughs> it looked like bullshit. Right. Kind of. But I, I can't argue with that. Um, yeah. Uh, and then w- one of this is another nitpick, but like <laughs> this is a kind of a weird nitpick, and this is more of a story element rather than. Uh, you know, a visual or structural, like the whole plot's revealed to be a, a big revenge mission, right? It's just like Slevin uh, is exacting justice on the two mob bosses that that killed his family uh, because of, of his father was like, uh, you know, it was his gambling debts that got him and his family in trouble. But then like willy nilly, they go and they kill Nick because of his gambling debts because he's they literally say, oh, he's a low life. No one will miss him. <laughs> But the whole thing's set in motion because a guy that owed money to these bookies got murdered. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I don't know. That, that was always very confusing. I'm just like, oh, that's, you know, now, now that that's when we're, we're going to get lucky number eighth or something. And that's going to be about Slate. Nick's family, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but see, Nick doesn't have any, he doesn't have like a wife and kids, anything. I mean, he's literally just like a low life that nobody cares about. <laughs> he just deserves to die in a shitty bus station? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. I guess I never thought about it. What does it say about me? But. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, as far as the shot, the shot, comp- you know, going back a little bit to the vis- visuals, though, like the shot composition, like the literal opening shot of the bus station, you get these like super like dialed up, like uh, like ultra realistic, um, like super blue chairs. And, and it just looks really good. Like everything is like it, everything pops in this, like the contrast is shot so well, even in like Nick's apartment where uh, Lucy Liu and uh, Slevin are having these these back and forth. Like the wallpapers roll weird, mm-hmm. and and like the environments that they're in are just as much characters as the characters themselves. I, I definitely agree, and and I guess that's kind of going back to the um, to the storyline, the made up storyline. I think that all fits it too, and it all kind of just it all kind of fits in line with that part of the storyline, whether it be the made up storyline or, you know, the rest of the movie. I mean, you know, the the bus stop, I mean, and it shows Nick and he's got, you know, he's all unshaven, you know, the neck beard going on and the bus stop just fits his demeanor. I challenge you audience to go check out Lucky Number Slevin. Uh, Go in with I, I don't know what kind of expectations to to take because like if you if you haven't seen this movie and not a lot of people did, uh, I, I, it's definitely worth watching. I say if you're a fan of early Guy Ritchie films, if you liked Lockstock, Two Smoking Barrels, and Snatch, but with just like 
you know, huge actors in it. Like, like I said, it, it's just like it's getting to see. It's the equivalent to seeing like Christopher Walken from Click. Like he, they just let him loose because he's just like I'm in an I'm in an Adam Sandler movie, and I'm you know <laughs> they just let him be like crazy Christopher Walken, and it elevated that movie from just being another shitty you know Sandler movie. Uh, I think that you know. The overall structure and in, in the in the plot to this is better than than that. Uh, so they could have gotten away with with other actors, and it still would have been enjoyable. But the fact that they have these people that you know and that you've you know loved and grown up with in these kind of roles just makes it so much fun to watch. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, if you do go and you do watch it, just remember it got horrible reviews. I, I, I may be amping this movie up too much. Because sometimes when you go into a movie with such high expectations, it just doesn't quite equal what you thought it was going to be. So, you know, it, it just remember, it's an old, you know, what, what do we say, $27 million budget. Yeah. Um, 2006, there wasn't any crazy effects or crazy action scenes. There wasn't any over, you know, over-the-top comedy. It was just... Uh, just a good, solid movie throughout. Yeah, you will not be bored whether they're, you know, shooting someone in the face or just having, like, a long, drawn-out, you know, back-and-forth, two-people, you know, like, uh, conversation. Uh, it's all good. One thing, uh, you know, I want to give credit to before we, we sign off because uh, there's the, the, the basically the big reveal, and this is, like, a, another huge spoiler, so this is, like, extra spoiler alert, uh, but, like... Uh, when they're kind of when he's exacting justice on the rabbi and uh, the boss, it that cutting is masterful. And I mean that that scene is cut together like better than a lot of other people with you know other directors with with more chops where they're not only you know cutting to him murdering these two, but they're cutting it in with them murdering his father from from the past. And the way that they do it and how clean it is, it's it's one of my favorite cinematic moments. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is, you know, another reason why I just every time I watch it, I anticipate that moment because it's just like, ah, oh, it's so it's so fantastic. That ending, because, you know, not only do you get to see their faces and, you know, the shock and the surprise, but you also, you know, every, all the way from Slevin walking down the stairs at the boss's condo, those, you know, the spiral stairs and then, you know, it, it cutting back and forth to, you know, to his family's death to this, um, you just get this like sense of, uh, I don't know. You, you, you feel his revenge, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's what, that's our take on lucky number 11. Have you all seen it? Will you go see it? Let us know in the comments. Hit the thumbs up button downstairs. Subscribe to the channel for more, you know, Cult of Films movie reviews and everything else crazy stuff that we do here. I want to give a very, very special thanks to my best friend in the world, Mr. Dead Guy Ty, Tyler Perez, for coming back on the, your much, uh, you know, anticipated return to the channel. And I'm so glad we got to, to talk about one of our mutual favorite movies tonight hell yeah man absolutely thanks for having me and uh it couldn't be for uh you know a, a better movie always a good time to uh you know hang out and talk and uh have a good beer want to talk movies with me you could do so on twitter at or as i've done uh until next time i don't have a sign off so